Hi, I'm Chris Roselli, and welcome to Western Window. On today's show, we present another episode of Office Hours with Western faculty member Dan Purdy. Office Hours explores ideas and issues of importance to the community in areas where faculty, staff, and students are helping to find solutions. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Western's Office Hours, where we discuss important topics and how Western is engaging with them. I'm your host, Dan Purdy, director of Western's Front Door to Discovery. I also teach marketing and entrepreneurship in the College of Business and Economics. We're coming to you today from the film studios at Western Washington University and Wilson Library. We're going to talk about a really important topic today, one that's been on all of our minds and in the news lately, uh, the mega quake that is expected uh, to hit the Pacific Northwest sometime in the future. Uh, various predictions um, uh, think about different times, and we're going to talk about some of that today and, and the impact uh, that it has on us. And I'm, I'm uh, joined by three wonderful guests today. Uh, Paul Gazdick, who is uh, Emergency Manager for the City of Bellingham. Jackie Kaplan Auerbach, who is a Professor of Geology and studies seismology. And Professor David Sautler, who studies uh, uh, psychology and the psychology of natural disasters. Thank you very much for joining me today. Pleasure to be here. So let's start with, I guess, Professor Kaplan Auerbach. A simple, perhaps, question maybe not as simple as we hope. What does this whole thing mean, a mega quake? Because that sounds kind of scary. Doesn't it though? Right? I know, does, right? I know. What does this whole thing, a mega quake, mean? Right, so the tendency has been recently to put on super volcano and mega quake and to, and to sort of make that sound very exciting. Um, Really what that means is a large earthquake. Um, we have terms that we use for smaller ones. You know, we have major and we have, uh, you know, a great earthquake is one over magnitude eight. And, and mega has come to mean basically a magnitude nine earthquake. Mm -hmm. And that is um, really kind of the largest category that we see on the planet. We've only really seen a handful of those in uh, sort of in human history. Mm -hmm. um, most there were several in the 1960s, and there have been several in the past couple of decades. So we've sort of been reawakened to that recently. And, um, and that is a hazard that we have here because of our plate tectonic environment. So it's something that we need to be aware of. But we haven't had one of these recently. The last one that we had of that magnitude was in the year 1700, and that was before we had a large population here. It was actually before we had a population with a written language. So it took us a while to also understand that that had happened. So as a consequence, our understanding of this is pretty young. And so we're just really sort of catching up on what we need to know about it here. So the, the New Yorker article made it, it was pretty vivid description. Yeah, it they was. Had. I think the, the, the FEMA director described it as everything west of I-5 being toast. That's right. Uh, and as Western sits west of I-5, <laughs> right. uh, I, I thought that was an interesting uh, concept. So I guess the first question is, is, is that hyperbole designed to scare us, or is there really scientific fact around here that, you know, maybe it will be toast? Right. So I did hear a couple of people say, oh, I'm fine. I live on Capitol Hill, you know. So if you're, you know, it isn't just that that's this nice dividing line. You know, obviously, you know, I live a mile away from I-5. It doesn't mean I'm okay and, or I'm toast and my neighbors are okay. Certainly, the greatest hazard is on the west side of the state. And that's because the region where the, the earthquake um, will happen whenever it does is on what's called, um, well, it's, this is all called a subduction zone. We have one tectonic plate, which in our case is offshore, diving beneath us, really, diving beneath the continent of what's called the North American plate. And that diving motion is not smooth. Plates are not Teflon. And they get stuck and they hang up, and then eventually that, that moves. And that motion is the quake. Where that happens, though, is at the place that, where those plates connect. And in our case, that's offshore. Um, so as you go closer to the offshore area, as you go closer to the coast, you are closer to where the shaking is most dramatic. And so certainly the western side of the state is expected then to see more dramatic effects of it. It's also largely you know, where our population is greatest in many respects on that west side of I-5. And what's important here is this subduction zone is about 70 miles off the coast. Mm -hmm. Now, we have precedent of other subduction zones around the world that have let loose, generated a 9.1 magnitude earthquake mm -hmm. off the coast of Banda Aceh, Indonesia in, sep in sep December of 2004, which created a devastating tsunami mm -hmm. and earthquake. So the earthquake resulted in a tsunami as well. So you had impact on land from mm -hmm. the earthquake shaking, but then you also had a very powerful tsunami that traveled across the Indian Ocean at about 550 miles an hour and killed 
uh, about a quarter of a million people and left 2.3 million people homeless around the Indian Ocean. And so one of the facts that we need to keep in mind is it's not just the earthquake shaking here in western Washington that will cause damage, but it's also the tsunami. And so as a result, it's extremely important that people in western Washington, British Columbia, um, Oregon, and even the northern California coast be aware that that tsunami that will be generated from the earthquake will reach shore within minutes or hours. So from Banda Aceh, Indonesia, all the way up to Thailand, it only took that way five hours to travel up to Thailand. Uh, here, 70 miles off mm -hmm. the coast, if we're talking about a wave that travels 550 miles an hour, what kind of advanced lead mm -hmm. time would an emergency manager have to notify citizens of Washington, British Columbia, Oregon, and so on, that that tsunami's coming? And likewise, there's evidence from the mm -hmm. 1700 earthquake that let loose on that same subduction zone over in Japan. So other areas around the Pacific Ocean are at risk for the tsunami that will be generated off of our coastline. Mm -hmm. that, that's I, was, a, yeah, I was just going to uh, jump in there too, and <laughs> actually after that there was a lot, uh, after 2004 there was a lot more um, money being funneled into uh, the National Oceanic Aviation mm -hmm. um, Administration to actually put in those buoys to be able to you know, sense right. any of that mm -hmm. going through. So it gives us a little bit more lead time, but obviously there's some other things that you should be looking for in, in a tsunami, like you know the sudden rushing out of water, those right. sorts of things that people can educate themselves now today so that it, if there is no warning, they can have in the back of the brain, oh, this is where we need to get out. Yep. And if I can just briefly build on that, one of the key lessons from the Indian Ocean tsunami was that people didn't recognize the warning mm -hmm. sign. And I'm not talking about a siren, because yep. sirens weren't in place. And let's say they didn't work, mm -hmm. but you were at the coast. Mm -hmm. What's the one warning yeah. sign? And the one main warning sign is the receding of the ocean. It looks like an extreme low tide, mm -hmm. even up to a quarter of a mile. Mm -hmm. And that's the cue. If you see that happening, you get inland immediately. Yeah, I do, I do want to add a couple of clarifying facts about this. The first is, mm -hmm. um, that you're absolutely right. The receding water is very important, and in fact, there was a wonderful story out of Thailand during that earthquake. Mm -hmm. There was a uh, there was a ten year old British girl who was vacationing with her family in Thailand, and she saw the water recede. And she had studied earthquakes in school, mm -hmm. or excuse me, tsunami, and she knew what was happening. And she was became hysterical, told her parents, "This is a tsunami," and her parents told the uh, manager of the hotel where they stayed and he evacuated that beach and no one died on that beach Wonderful. because of a 10 year old girl. So that is very important. The caveat though, <clears throat> two things, is at first not all places will see a recession first. Mm -hmm. That tsunamis are sometimes heralded by a rise first. So simply waiting for that recession may not be the trick. And the second, when we talk about the sirens and the, the dark, what are called dart buoys, the deep ocean mm -hmm. um, reporting in, in, of tsunamis, uh, or deep ocean assessment reporting of tsunamis, those are buoys that can tell us when a tsunami is traveling across oceans. The dart buoys will not help us for a local quake. They will not help us locally. They will help Japan and they will help Alaska mm -hmm. and they will help Hawaii. So there are two really different aspects of, of the tsunami warning system. One is that the tsunami warning centers are really there for what we call tele-tsunamis, tsunamis that are traveling across oceans. Local residents have to know to get themselves off the coast without waiting for that siren. And so we often tell people, if you are on the coast and the ground shakes hard enough that you cannot stand, do not wait for the siren, do not look for the water, get to high ground. Because you'll only have 15 to 20 minutes before that wave will hit. Now, a, the other important thing to mention is that's really, that's on the coast. And there's no question that our greatest concern for tsunami is along the coastal regions. But I get a lot of questions about, well, how are we in Bellingham? Mm -hmm. What about the sound? Right. How are we here? But how far and from the coast do you need to go to be safe? Right. right. And so certainly, you know, the distance from the coast isn't the bigger issue. It's the elevation. And right? mm -hmm. you want to get to high ground. You, right. you know, inland is better, but high ground is most important. But once we start going down the Straits of Juan de Fuca and certainly into the Sound, there's a lot of sort of breaking up of that wave we anticipate from islands. Islands can also amplify it in some respects, but most of the models here, my understanding, says that it gets diminished. Right. That particular quote about everything west of I-5 being toast was in a portion of that New Yorker article that was devoted to tsunamis. And it struck mm -hmm. me that it sounded as if this wave was going to wash over the Olympic Mountains and it was going to come into the Sound. And really, that's not the case. The, the tsunami is anticipated to ha have the greatest devastation along the coast. But the effects as you go further away 
are, are diminished. But it's well, significant to the coast. And, and we're, of course, you know, more concerned about what's going to happen in western Washington. Mm -hmm. But if you go down to Oregon, right. right, and you've got that entire stretch of coast, and you don't have the the Olympic Mountains to shield you, Correct. well then it that might be more accurate that west of I-5 could be toast. I think that's when you look at Seaside mm -hmm. and Lincoln Beach and Cannon Beach and all mm -hmm. those sort of things, there's yeah. really nothing to stop a tsunami from coming in. Mm -hmm. In in Bellingham, are we are we in any in any danger from a tsunami? Along the very waterfront there's a, a relatively mm -hmm. small hazard. And the most recent models that I understand are from, I think, 2004. There, were some, there was some NOAA modeling. Um, and so I think those will likely be revised just because, you know, we know a lot more now. We know a lot more because of the earthquake that hit Sumatra, and we know a lot more because of the Tohoku 2011 Japan earthquake. Right, right. We've really learned a great deal more about how these large earthquakes contribute to the size of the wave. Um, that said, what we see in Bellingham is that the primary hazard is really right down on the waterfront, and the models now are for one, maybe two meters of run-up. And that sounds like, oh, one to two meters, you know, well, that's over my head for sure. Um, and it doesn't take a very strong wave to knock something over, to knock a person over, to knock a building over. So it doesn't take a very large wave. So a meter is a substantial hazard. But it also means you don't have to go that high in elevation to get away. And so, you know, we have a fairly steep um, approach down to the water, which means, you know, one could relatively easily get away if they knew that wave was coming. Yeah. Now, Dr. Sadler, you've done a lot of work in preparedness. Yes. Uh, how, do, how, do we, how do we prepare for something that almost seems like you, you can't prepare for it? Exactly. You know, as, as we speak now, we have a beautiful image behind us and a just beautiful Mount Baker that we all love. We well, Mount St. Helens erupted, and Mount Baker may erupt sometime. Mount uh, Rainier may erupt sometime, but when? Now, we know that chances are good that the earthquake will happen in western Washington. We just don't know exactly when. The problem from a psychological perspective is that every day we don't prepare, we almost get reinforced not to prepare the next day because nothing happened. And I think you know one of the ways to look at this is, as children and as adults, we get uh, immunizations for potential diseases. If you travel overseas, you might have to get uh, immunizations uh, for various uh, potential illnesses from mosquitoes or waterborne illnesses. Um, and that's insurance. We have insurance on our homes. We have insurance on our cars. Now, the government requires us to have insurance on our cars in order to drive, but we're not required to have preparation for earthquakes or hurricanes or tsunamis or floods or volcanic eruptions? That's a great question, Paul. You're working with the government and, uh, you know, not that you could just legislate things, no. but, but is there a reason that, that, I mean, in Japan, they do. They, do, they legislate this sort of thing. There's training. There's mm -hmm. all stuff you have to do with building codes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're training kids on how to recognize tsunamis, right. how to respond to them. We don't do that here. Sure. And, and I'll, I'll speak to the efforts, I guess, of what we're trying to do, or why we shouldn't, I shouldn't say we, what the federal government is trying to do, is they actually have uh, what's called a STEP program. Uh, so they go into fifth graders' um, classrooms and they talk about preparedness. So they're trying to get them at a younger age to kind of get that vernacular going. But I do agree. I mean, there should be some sort of regulation, something. I mean, we're, we're standing, you know, with our faces turning blue, trying to get people to prepare and understanding the psychology of if it's not happening, you're cashing in that day. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I'm not necessarily arguing for no. governmental <laughs> regulation of this, that you know, there's some law that requires this, but what I am saying is that if you know that you live in an area that's prone to hurricanes, that's prone to earthquakes, that's prone to flooding, you need special education. Mm -hmm. So when I went to graduate school at Michigan State, I didn't know a lot about tornadoes. And what happened on one of the first days I was at Michigan State? <laughs> My advisor told me about tornadoes and what part of the room to go into and <laughs> where. We need that kind of education in schools. Uh, it needs to be consistent. Mm -hmm. So if it's a Red Cross program mm -hmm. that could be brought into uh, K through 12 and even at uh, Western mm -hmm. so that people know what they should do and in, as well as in the general community. One very simple thing to do is um, have your food and water on supply on hand mm -hmm. and that will last for about a year let's say until mm -hmm. the expiration date comes up and be just before the expiration date consume the food and the water and then replenish it so if you can just get into a habit that just like we have spring cleaning, let's say, and people in go fact, through their goods. In fact, what we do in my house, I have an emergency preparedness kit that's very much this kind of thing. Uh -huh. We have food and water and um, many other items. Um, 
but every year on the anniversary of the 1700 earthquake uh -huh. that the last magnitude 9 to hit this area which is January 26 every January 26 we go in mm -hmm. and we go through it to replace old materials. So if you can pick something, now of course, as a seismologist, I remember January 26, not everybody does, but you can pick something that's important to you and, and make it a habit. Well, that's know. the date then, have Western Washington or have the state of Washington, sure. have the schools, sure. have January 26th as sure. a it's disaster, an emergency, preparedness emergency day. kit mm -hmm. renewal day. Yeah, but it's also important to be able to kind of alleviate some of those concerns particularly for kids and for parents, right. you know, who wonder, right, to know kind of that we have a plan that we will follow. It kind of goes a long way to, to alleviating some of that terror that reading that article inspired in people, you know. You know, it's hard to anticipate what it's going to be like. You know, you, yeah. they can use the word toast, but what we're talking about uh, is damage to infrastructure so mm -hmm. that you won't have telephone. Cell phone tire, towers mm -hmm. will be out. Telephones in the home may be out. Cable's going to be out. Internet's going to be out. Those bridges on Interstate 5 likely will collapse. Even if a few collapse, that means that you aren't going to get goods, uh, foods and supplies and tents and other necessities of life won't easily come in. Mm -hmm. um, and it's trying to understand what that post-disaster situation will be like so that all of us can take care of our, of our families. The chance that government agencies or even disaster response agencies will be able to bring in the quantity of yeah. materials that are needed for so many people is very slim within the first few days when people need food and water and shelter and clothing. We, we, we all saw what happened in Katrina. And, that's right. And, and you know, Hurricane yeah. Sandy, and we're familiar with some of those things. And that's, that's where some of that has changed, too. I mean, you see, you learn those lessons, and you put that in an after-action report, and then you change the way that you're presenting it to local emergency managers. So now uh, what they used to do before Sandy is they would create a regional spot where they would bring the point of distribution mm -hmm. stuff that they right. would need and they realize in Sandy those roadways and infrastructure is gone. Mm -hmm. So now they have the communities identify which areas that they would set up what are called C-Pods or community points of distribution. And it's a good area that everybody's familiar with, usually you know, large like the Civic Center field or you know, larger places, mm -hmm. and then they drop those resources in. But you're right, I mean, having a plan in, in place for that first 72 hours is something that is you know, it, it, basically essential for living in this area. So let's talk about that, the infrastructure. Uh, as I was trying to learn more about this in preparation for our conversation, I noticed, boy, there are a whole bunch of resources online. Mm -hmm. But if there is no online, right. how is that supposed to help you? Right. Well, what do we do then? And part of that is the, re you know, at least, I'm not entirely sure all the resources you looked up, but you obviously can't wait to get your preparedness kit and make sure what you've got, you know, you have that in place. So don't go looking to see what you need when it happens. Um, so there is a lot of education that has to be done prior to the event, and I think that the internet is an extraordinary thing, and we're very lucky to have it. There's a lot of information online that leads us astray, but ultimately, if we're looking for information about this, we're probably going to be okay. Um, but it has to happen in advance. It's just not the kind of thing we can be reactionary. So about. you can go to FEMA.gov, Federal Emergency Management mm -hmm. Agency. They have a checklist. You could go to American Red Cross. They also have checklists, mm -hmm. which will uh, give you a good indication of the types of of supplies you need on hand, how to protect your valuable documents, your insurance papers, birth certificates, passports, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and just very quickly going back to um, one of the questions about infrastructure, again referring to the picture behind us. That ocean right there, that inland water, may be our salvation because that's one very good way that we could get goods mm -hmm. brought in, that people could access this easily through a ship. So Western has an emergency management committee that for many, many years has been tasked with looking at potential threats to the university through uh, natural disasters, for example, and what we can do to uh, mitigate those threats and how we can respond to them. And one of the recommendations that we've talked about for years now is having relationships with other universities and other agencies elsewhere out of the potentially affected area so that they could help us in the event of an emergency, and likewise, it would be reciprocal. If they needed help, we would be very happy to help them as well. So shifting slight gear just a little bit in terms of um, <laughs> the probability of this thing. Uh, a lot was made in the article about this notion of us being overdue mm -hmm. for a, quote, mega quake or, or, or a large earthquake of some type. Uh, and, and the article gave the 
the period at which the, the earthquakes have happened historically at about 240 right. years, and we're 315 years out from, from right. January 26, 1700. So what does this mean to so us, right? I mean, in terms right. of, does that mean we should all really be just waiting <laughs> any moment now? It could happen, well, you or know, I had a what? professor in grad school who, when he talked about, he was a volcanology professor, and he would talk about um, eruptions and say, well, you know, when will the next great eruption happen? He was a little British guy. You know, it could be in a thousand years, and it could be next Tuesday. And I've sort of always thought of that in my mind. It could be in a thousand years, and it could be next Tuesday. And, and the problem is that we thought for a long time that earthquakes were well behaved and we thought that they would you know this strain would build up in the plate for a while and then be released and then it would reset and the clock when we you know the clock would reset and we'd start over again and we thought we had a characteristic cycle and all the data that we've collected now says no that doesn't work sometimes the earthquake you know happens when you expect and it's small and other times it's larger and it's well before you thought and and it turns out that the planet is not as well behaved as we had hoped and so the idea of this being overdue is it's not a, a word that we would use scientifically. Um, so what we can say is that we have certain probabilities, but probabilities are also challenging because they're not a guarantee. Mm -hmm. The best thing we can do is say, we know at some point it will happen. And that preparedness should take place whether or not it's you know, going to be next Tuesday or in a decade or in a hundred years. I mean, it's prudent to be ready. Um, you know, people ask me a lot about earthquake prediction. When are we going to be able to predict earthquakes? And A, thus far we don't believe they're predictable. Um, the science sort of indicates that there simply is no indicator that they're going to happen. But more to the point, they're going to happen. And when they are, the infrastructure is going to have difficulty and we're still going to need to communicate with our loved ones. There's not much that will change about that. So if we're prepared, it doesn't matter if we know a day before, it matters less if we know a day before or we know 10 years in advance. That preparation needs to be the same. So ultimately, let's put our money in that way. Let's make sure our infrastructure remains standing. Let's so Professor Sattler, what kind of psychological effects do people suffer? When you are facing extreme hardships, when your home has been destroyed, when your community's been destroyed, when you can't go to the grocery store because there is no grocery store to get mm. food, when you can't easily access water, when you can't go find tents to live in because your house has been destroyed, when you can't drive your car because there's no gas or the roads are damaged, what do you do? And if you have those supplies on hand, and if you have a plan, and you have those connections with your neighbors and friends so that you know that you're there to help them and they're help, there to help you, that's the way out. Um, through friendships and relationships and community, by working together, then we can pull through these very, very challenging situations. What, what is the city of Bellingham and, and our regional partners, the federal partners, mm -hmm. uh, what's going on to prepare in advance for this mm -hmm. Um, so that so that we can we can as a community meet the challenge when when it because we know it's going to happen when it happens. Yep, and it, it's really twofold. I think it, it, from the front end, it's getting the community members prepared, whether that's uh, encouraging them to volunteer and be a community emergency response member in the, our CERT program, um, going to neighborhoods and basically kind of explaining that you know meet your neighbors, kind of walk walk through, see if you have a plan at because that's what it's going to be. You take this macro level disaster and you make it micro. You you know back down to the community roots like it used to be. You know kind of the back to the basics as you're saying. And then um, we have an all hazards approach for the for the second part. I mean we we go and look at every single type hazard that could potentially happen within the city of Bellingham or Whatcom County. But more specifically, um, next year uh, June 2016, uh, state of Oregon and Washington, along with you know the multiple cities counties, is participating in a uh, a tabletop exercise, which is kind of the base level exercise in emergency management, going over this uh, actual 9.0 with tsunami and walking through all those different things, so that we can get some lessons learned about all right now this is our new reality what's what can we do what steps can we take that are going to work and what steps and what things are we going to do that are not going to work and then readjust our plans as we go through we have a lot of old buildings mm -hmm. in our area mm -hmm. and the article estimated some of the 75 percent of buildings would would be considerably damaged if mm -hmm. not collapsed during mm -hmm. a large-scale earthquake so what's happening with that kind of infrastructure 
I mean, a lot of people are going to die if buildings collapse in downtown Bellingham. There are a lot of people who live there, a lot more now than there were 10 years ago. Right. And with the new waterfront, we're even going to get more. So mm-hmm. what's, how's that, what's the city doing about that? Uh, well, that's all ordinance stuff that's outside of my purview as far as you know, understanding building structure code, that sort of thing. But there are simple steps to take as a, um, as a person building their home. I mean, they talked about some of the, mm-hmm. you know, a few thousand dollars to just bolt your home and you know, wood will sway, whereas brick will, will yeah. crumble. Uh, we kind of come in at the, at, at the end of it or the back end of it and it's like, okay, now what are we going to do? There's this debris everywhere. We need to re- you know, move the debris, put it somewhere, that sort of stuff. So ordinances and building code things, uh, mm-hmm. while it would be nice to have those in place to uh, properly mitigate some of those older buildings, it's not really my wheelhouse per se. But we do have building codes in, in sort of the Pacific Northwest have been... Um, created with the understanding that we have a substantial seismic hazard since about the 1990s. So buildings that have been built since that time are large, very likely built to a fairly high seismic code. And so the thing we worry about are a lot of these older buildings. And so for example, my house was built in 1900. You know, my house is not bolted to the foundation. And because it is wood frame and because large earthquakes, you know, sort of one of the little weird scientific nuances is that large earthquakes tend to produce very long period waves. And those are often more damaging to tall buildings. Smaller earthquakes can have a more violent high frequency shaking that damages smaller buildings. So there's also this aspect of understanding it. That said, anything can walk off its foundation. And it's entirely likely that my house will be lovely and intact and off to the side of the foundation and useless. So yeah, I'm saving my pennies to bolt that house down so that if it does stand up, it is wood. Well, it sounds like that's one possibly useful collaboration is between mm-hmm. the building codes, ordinance type folks, and the emergency preparedness folks. Yeah. That that you know, talking about how do we make things safer before, that's not right. just how do we respond to the disaster afterwards. So let's wrap up. And what I'd like each of you to do is give a, a tweet, a very <laughs> short one piece. If you had one piece of guidance that you could give uh, somebody watching the show today. Um, to prepare, to learn, to whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's start, start with you, David. Just one piece of guidance that you could give the folks out there. I'm just going to be general. Hashtag be prepared. There you go. <laughs> Jackie. I'm never that concise. <laughs> um, I tell my students, earthquakes don't kill people. Falling buildings kill people. Mm-hmm. And so I would say do what you can to keep your home intact, bolt your uh, bookshelves to the wall, strap down your water heater, do what you can to keep your little piece of the world intact at that time. Build a kit, make a plan, be informed. That sounds like a slogan. That was better. (laughs) That was a genuine tweet. That was a genuine tweet. (laughs) tweet. Well, thank you all for joining me today. I know I've learned a great deal. Uh, It's a really important topic, and and I thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, And thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, it's such an important topic. We really, really just barely scratched the surface, uh, but we'll do more of this as we can. So until next time, we'll see you.